Hey, it's me, Melvo Baptiste. I'm joined by uh, one of my favourite DJs, I would say that, and also he's my uncle, Norman Jay. We've got this lineage through the family. He introduced me to so many great records over the years. Records that I still play in my radio shows, out in clubs now. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Norman, welcome. We're sat here in Shoreditch on Curtain Road. So the very first thing you pointed out was between 10 and 15 years ago, we were in a car park opposite there doing a New Year's party. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I remember the gig and I remember it particularly because it was actually the first time you let me on the decks at a Good Times party. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I think by then you've earned, earned your, your spurs. I remember that night, the boy did good. You did all right, you, just, you, you and Russell. I just played all your records. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Notting Hill Carnival, good times. We'll just go down in folk history, just as the most amazing street party, the most amazing weekend of anyone's life. But before we get into the real juice of Notting Hill Carnival, I used to go and watch you play, and wherever it was, standing on a bar selling drinks, or in the back, the way you would move between genres and between records. I just thought that's what all DJs had to do. That's how you play. Until I got up there and tried to do it. And it was, was that like a thing for you just growing up? Was it about rocking a party? Was, it, was that how you learned to DJ? When I started, basically you had to be a drag of all trades. If you're gonna play the music, especially on a reggae sound system, the whole focus is about um, engaging and keeping the engagement and the attention of the crowd. It's a very difficult thing when you lose the momentum. Hit it. Growing up with you and, and my dad, always around, we were always talking music. And my dad, even now, his memory for a record and a moment is phenomenal. Mine's good too. <laughs> but that's all. Don't ask me about anything else. Maybe even more than the music, it's, it's about the element of dance and how important dance was in the clubs back then. Well, it was really important to us because that was the only outlet, creative outlet, and freedom of expression that, that we had. You know, life really was miserable, especially if you were a person of colour. You know, you leave your house, you don't know whether you're going to get picked up by the old bill beaten up. You know, uh, it, it wasn't a great time. Speaking personally, the only solace I found was in my music and the only creative, you know, escape that I had was dancing in clubs, which is why I've always loved records and played records that had the day, Saturday, weekend, going out, party. Those records were speaking to me because that's how I lived. I heard a, um, there was a comment from a, a US singer called Danielle Ponder just recently, and she said that um, in moments of injustice or despair comes great music or, or great things usually. You look back in black history, you know, it's, um, music has always come out of sufferation. You know, the blues came out of sufferation. You know, in every part of the world, <laughs> you know, music has always played a pivotal role in change. You can have all the politics you want and people debating in in closed rooms for all, all, all you want. If you really want to get your message across, the greatest vehicle outside of television or the internet is music. Yeah which is why governments fear music it's the ultimate it's the voice of the unheard it's the voice of protest it's the voice of change i love protest songs i remember one year probably at the peak of the popularity of good times of playing the clash to a predominantly black crowd it was by accident in the beginning i went to play a, a clash tune and i ended up playing white riot and i put it on and my brother looked at me, and in that split second, I was going to lift the needle. I thought, no, let it play. Because I'm not going to deny that I love The Clash. You know, that's the one thing that Carnival gave me the confidence to do. I'm, this is my sound. I'm not going to deny myself any music I like. Something you just said there about um, you played The Clash. You definitely told me a story one day where um, Joey would jump on first, and um, you would be there, uh, you would come on, and if you played anything that sounded like kind of soul boy music, Joey might have to jump back on and kind of back you a little bit. I'd been in New York for six weeks, seven weeks before August 1980. I'd come back with tons of records, still in the cellophane. Yeah. And it was like the dub reggae thing, you know, like when on the dub reggae sound system, they, 
break in and they're putting on brand new dubs. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was doing that with new 12s. Play the wrong record and you could incite a riot. But anyway, I was playing tunes and within seconds of the tunes being played, take off that music, it's all boy, but he might me take it off. And my brother, luckily, <laughs> Big Locks, would come on, put on a dub tune, and suddenly all them Rasta men would come to the front, see a Rasta man playing music, and then chill. <laughs> You were in quite a unique position. You had the heritage thing and the traditional sound system culture. But then I guess a lot of the US DJs playing block parties and stuff with the more kind of US disco and stuff. Yeah. But you were kind of marrying yeah. the two cultures together. Well, the, the, the cultures come from the, from the same origin because all the New York block parties you find, all of those guys are of Jamaican extraction yeah. anyway. Yeah. Our lot come to England we create the sound system because the, the closest we could do that was at Carnival. And even in the beginning, we weren't allowed to put our speakers on the street and play. Now we're known as one of the, the original disciplines, but 20, 30 years ago, we weren't. So did it take years to kind of evolve that Carnival crowd? Yeah, it did take a long time. And I'm glad it took a long time because it was, it was a long-term thing. But at the time I was young, fearless, um, and really on a mission. I was evangelical about it. I was on a mission to get our sort of music accepted at Carnival. Um, I go there in 79 on my own, basically on a reconnaissance mission. See who's playing what, which sound system to carry in, where the crowds go. So I'm basically doing my homework. So by the time we decided to make a commitment to go in 1980, I already had a roadmap, I already had a plan. People often forget that connection between it wasn't just about a DJ playing records and, and a reaction. It was also about how good your sound was yeah. as well. That was a huge part of it. Yeah, well, we married the two. It's always, always about, you know, Joey really would spend months prepping and getting that sound ready. You know, my role was to make sure we had tunes that nobody could, nobody could play. Nobody could come near us. You know, 12-inch disco records would sound even better on a reggae sound system. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to deliver a bass line, you could only deliver, a, because we played it in mono, played funk records. You'd never hear them like that in a club. You know, you'd feel that bass at the end of the road. When we're talking about records that connected like that at Carnival, there's so many we could go through, and even with genres, like you cross so many different genres. We broke a lot of records at Carnival. Broke a lot of records yeah, at Carnival. Yeah, yeah. And if we want to talk about lineage and records that I would have heard you play and records that I can still play today and just see a ridiculous reaction. One I have to talk about is New York and Soul. It's all right, I feel it. Came out of a few months before Carnival. And at the moment I got the promo, I was like, in my record room, thinking, my goodness, this is going to kill people at Carnival. <laughs> just as the bass. So it's one of the, those records that you, you have, you've got it, you can't wait to play it and you need to pick your moment when you play it. And everyone was like, and I just saw everyone, it reminded me of Acid House. Yeah. That had never happened at good times before. People are cheering, but everyone's eyes closed, hands in the air, like, this is church. And then an hour later, I played it again. If a tune is liked by the crowd and it's working, that tune will get played two, three, four times. You make it an anthem in one day. You know, I, I, I have always seen myself, especially in my later years, as an emotional DJ. I play off emotion. I'm kind of in tune with what's going on around me, and the music I play, more so now than ever, needs to reflect what's going on around me, commenting. You know, and I always make subtle messages, like the messages in the music, those who have ears can, can hear it. <laughs> 